Good evening. Welcome to um, our student town hall. Thank you for joining us. I am Evan A. Williams, the Director of Virtual Experience and Peer Engagement Initiatives for the Student Affairs, and I will be your moderator this evening. I would like to re read the following land acknowledgement to begin the, our time together this evening. The UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land and original people of the area where our campus is located. The university was built on unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. The Kumeyaay people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We are honored to share this space with them and we thank them for their stewardship of the Mat Kumeyaay, um, as you would say in English, La Jolla, California. This town hall, we have a group of panelists who are here to, here to answer questions about Return to Learn program. We will attempt to answer the questions and please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A feature of Zoom. Due to our limitation, we will not be able to answer all your questions, but we'll be logging them and your questions will be posted or answers to your questions will be posted on our Return to Learn website, which is returntolearn.ucsd.edu. The webinar also will have closed captioning available in two ways. First, you can click the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles, or you can also click the link that is pasted in the chat for your, for your ease. To start our, our town hall this evening, we are gonna have words from our chancellor, Pradeep Khosla. Thank you. Thank you, Ebene, uh, and good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, I just want to say a few words about our Return to Learn program. And when we, so when we expanded our multi-layered multi Return to Learn program this fall, we had data that predicted success. So we were reasonably confident we would succeed. And I'm happy to say today that our success, your success, and you will see why I say that, has far surpassed our planning assumptions. Throughout the fall quarter, our students, which is you all, have been very, very exemplary. Because of you, our campus, your campus, enjoys one of the lowest numbers of COVID-19 cases in the country. Since March 1, we have conducted nearly 80,000 student tests and 20,000 campus employee tests. We have expanded our wastewater testing from six to 52 sampling sites and are adding more for a total of 100 across our whole campus. So I hope you're not surprised when you get these messages literally on a daily basis now because we are detecting the virus long before it's being inject, uh, ejected through the nose in the air. Uh, we have increased our support to our faculty and to our students for remote learning. We have constructed outdoor classrooms for in-person and hybrid learning. We have continued to closely follow guidelines for masking and physical distancing and sanitation. We have consistently screened, tested and sequestered and isolated when necessary. So the data is in and shows that our students are safer living on campus than in our greater community. So just give you some numbers. From October 1, which is the start of the quarter, to December 6th, one week short of the end of the quarter, the 14-day positivity rate for UC San Diego students on campus has been 0.12%. And the positivity rate, positivity rate for students off campus is 0.62%. This compares with 2.7% and 7.4% in the community during the same time. So you can see there is a big difference. You are 50 to 60 times safer living on campus than off campus. And all of this is because of consistent participation in all strategies of return to learn throughout the fall quarter, which has made our campus 10 to 20 times safer than living outside. From the beginning, you embrace the idea of Tritons protecting Tritons, a simple but very important and impactful concept, Tritons protecting Tritons. You wore masks. Six, kept six feet of distance, wash your hands. You completed the daily screening and were tested regularly. Many of you opted into the California Notify as an additional layer of protection. Our Triton Health Ambassadors have continued to offer peer encouragement and support. And you have done extremely well, exceedingly well. But remember, our work is not done. We cannot assume success and let our guard down. As we wind down this fall, fall quarter, it's important to remember that more than ever, you need to continue to wear your masks, wash your hands often, and avoid unmasked gatherings. Complete your daily screenings and weekly testing to ensure personal safety and safety of others. 
And thank you for understanding that success for all of us is determined by choices that each one of us makes. And on Friday, we are going to send you an update about campus operations for the winter quarter. Uh, and I hope you enjoy your upcoming break. You worked hard. You've earned it. Stay safe. Stay strong. And make sure the choices you make decides how protected are people around you. So let me just say thank you for a great uh, quarter. I look forward to welcoming you back uh, come the new year. And Ebony, back to you. Thank you so much, Chancellor. It's so encouraging to hear our community and how we've responded to COVID. To provide a quick run through of how the webinar is going to go, I'd like to welcome the host of this town hall, Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, Allison Satterlin. Thanks, Ebony. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you that joined us this evening and those of you that um, worked to bring the town hall together. And a special thanks to our moderators, um, uh, the Associated Students and the Graduate and Professional Student Association. And um, again, thanks to um, my colleagues and friends for being here this evening to answer questions and provide updates. So what we'll be doing tonight is um, providing an, an overview of sort of the state of the uh, pandemic and um, also um, taking the uh, most important uh, time tonight to answer your questions that um, many have been presented in advance and um, also those that'll be provided to us live through the Q&A. And our event tonight will be moderated by the leadership, again, of Associated Students and the Graduate uh, Professional and Student Association. So uh, I thank you for your time tonight. And I just want to reiterate what Chancellor Kosla offered tonight, that we know that things are particularly challenging with the recent California State Home Order. Um, we also know that the, the surge continues uh, across San Diego uh, nationally and globally, and uh, pandemic fatigue is set in and, um, and yet many of you um, uh, continue to uh, mask and physically distance and, and test weekly. And I, I know that you've made incredible sacrifices. I, I promise you that when we come back together for Sun God and Spirit Night and uh, our D1 transition athletic events, uh, this time will have all been, uh, been worth it because we'll be uh, in a healthy uh, community together again. So we'd like to provide you with updates and most importantly, answer your questions. And uh, Dr. Williams, I'll hand it back over to you so we can get started on that. Thank you so much, Vice Chancellor Satterlin. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone who's joining us today that the Q&A feature is where you can answer questions. We have a great group of panelists that are off screen who are prepared to answer some of your questions. We will also have a live Q&A, as you heard, hosted by our leadership of Associated Students and the Graduate Student Association. But next, we're going to start this um, webinar off with hearing an update from Dr. Angela Sosham, the Interim Director of Student Health and Wellbeing Services, to bring us up to speed on the pandemic, how we've been doing this fall. You heard some great numbers from the Chancellor, tell you about self-testing, and um, yeah, with that, Dr. Sosham. Thanks, Ebony, and good evening. So I do have to start off with some of the sobering news um, that is very real of the rise of the viral activity uh, throughout the country, in California, as you know, we're now in lockdown, and in San Diego. Here's some of the information specifically about San Diego. And what you see in, is November was a very dramatic rise in both the percentage of positive cases, so everybody having a test, how many of them are positive, very striking increase in a matter of a couple of weeks, and then the absolute number of new cases, and you see the same dramatic increase in the number of new cases in San Diego. As you know, we're in the purple tier, but that's almost superseded by the state being in a lockdown state. Next slide. So how about our campus? And as the chancellor mentioned, we've done a really very good job. The students, you guys have been absolutely, truly amazing. But what you see is that November rise, which was dramatic in the county on the left on the top line, we also started to see in our student community as well. Slower and not as dramatic a rise, but we started out at a 0.1% positivity rate and we've been closer to 0.6% in the recent days. So this slow rise, we are feeling the viral impact in our student community. This is from the Return to Learn dashboard. I encourage all of you to take advantage of the dashboard. You'll get the latest information every day it's updated. 
we break down the student community into those living on campus and those off campus. It's a pretty good marker, although occasionally a student who's on campus has actually moved back home, but we use where you get the most information we have available to divide into an on-campus and off-campus in San Diego community. And you'll see we separate the new cases that way. And you'll see an uptick in the on-campus as well as some increase in the off-campus community in these recent weeks. Next slide. And I want to point this out a little bit. This is just the on-campus students. And this is really quite an amazing job. And the off-campus students did a great job as well. But on campus, you saw every week we were hardly seeing any cases. And then it started to pick up with Thanksgiving break. And it's related to the unmasked activities. Some of those were folks who went home to be with their families. Um, when they're with their families, sometimes it's more than just their immediate families. There were other people that they interacted with. Sometimes it was just students just leaving campus for a day for a meal unmasked. But we definitely saw a pattern that those individuals who acquired the virus had been involved in these unmasked activities. And I'm gonna to refer to them a little bit later, but I want you all to keep it in mind as you approach the next two weeks to get yourself through the finals uh, healthy as possible. And as you think about your activities over winter break, to try and keep the circles of individuals that you spend time with unmasked to small numbers of individuals. Spend a lot of time with those folks, but try not to spend time with lots and lots of individuals because you will increase your risk of acquiring this virus and actually starting winter quarter in not the best of um, <laughs> medical health. Next slide. So how are we trying to do with our viral detection? The daily screening, as the chancellor mentioned, is really important. If you're having symptoms, you're gonna get a red thumb, you're gonna be encouraged to have testing. Testing is available every day, and I'll talk about the different ways we test, as well as if you've had an exposure, you're gonna get a yellow thumb. In those two settings, you should stay in your residential space. If you're off campus, stay in your apartment, only come out for the testing. If you haven't had an exposure, you don't have any symptoms, you've got a green thumb, you're good to go. What kind of testing do we have available? We have multiple testing sites throughout San Diego in partnership with the health system, as well as on campus at the Price Center and the Athena Circle. Uh, Price Center is a walk-in only. There is no driving into the Price Center. Athena Circle, you can drive through. You also can bike through or walk through. Um, and the test results are usually available with in 24 to 36 hours. At the uh, drive-through sites, the testing is provider-based testing. At the Price Center, our students are doing provider-observed self-testing. And we've just recently introduced the option of totally self-administered testing. Uh, this has been a real plus for our students. We have a number of sites where you can actually walk up, pick up a test, do your testing at that time, or you can take it back to your unit and test a day or two later. You need to do it within three days though and bring it back and drop your sample right off into a collection bin. We have sites now at Muir, Seventh College, uh, Nuevo um, uh, Fitness Center, as well as the Price Center. So, and, and REMAC will be another site for our athletes to be able to do their testing. So we have a number of ways that you can do testing. Please take advantage of the testing. Um, students should be testing. Um, really, we've moved to weekly testing. With this increase in viral activity, we want you to test at least once a week. And I'll explain to some increased testing if you've been involved in unmasked activities. We're also, as the Chancellor mentioned, looking at the wastewater samples. If you get a signal and a message that your building that you're living in, we have a signal from that building, please test. Even if you tested a day or two ago, retest. There's no cost to you to retest. And we've seen individuals will test on a Monday negative and on a Thursday, they'll be positive. So even if you've had a recent test, take advantage. If there is a signal or a message to you that there's been a wastewater signal, please retest. Next slide. Okay, so it's really important that everyone has their My Student Chart activated. Make sure you choose the location as student health and well being. That My Student, we've had some students accidentally sign up under the health system. The disadvantage of that is has to do with your insurance and uh, with the testing that can be complicated for you. So I don't want to have any problems at all. So make sure you've chosen the student health and well being in My Student Chart you use your AD and login to gain access. Next slide. And 
The other thing that we want to make sure you've signed up for is your UCSD mobile app. This is very important for the self-administered testing. So when you do self-administered testing, we identify the sample by a barcode method, and we use the UCSD app to um, capture that barcode. So it's important that you have this loaded onto your phone. And um, with that, we identify your sample and we get your results right back to you in your My Student Chart the next day. Next slide. I want to encourage you to take advantage of the Cal Notify app, the Cal, um, California COVID Notify app. With this, um, the way it helps is if you're an individual who has it installed and another individual has it installed, the first person is positive you will get a signal within two hours that you've been exposed if you've been around that individual for 15 minutes within six feet. That exposure notification may precede the classic contact tracing by two, six, eight hours. So that tells you to stay in place. You've been exposed. We'll ask you to talk to a student health provider to clarify things and uh, also provide you with guidance on to the next step. So I encourage you to please download the app. Next slide. Just a little reminder about isolation, quarantine, and sequestration. You may have read some uh, information. The CDC has changed some quarantine guidelines, and I'll speak to those as well. So students who test positive for the virus will receive clinical support, whether they're on campus or off campus. The Student Health Services team will be there for you and will be talking to you throughout the process of your illness until you fully recover. The CAPS teams also provides mental health support for students as well. And we coordinate with the UCSD public health team on case investigation and contact tracing. That means for any student who's positive, there'll be a case investigation to determine if there are any other contacts, particularly anybody else in the campus community, other students, and we'll reach out to those individuals who have been exposed. On campus, we have dedicated isolation and quarantine housing where the students have their own bedroom, bathroom. They're the only individual in the unit. They get full meal support and basic needs. This is offered both to the students who reside on campus as those living off campus. We found that a number of our off-campus students find it difficult to isolate or quarantine in the settings of their apartments, or um, you know, there may be six students living in a a three bedroom apartment with only two bathrooms, it's actually hard to isolate in that setting. So we offer the students the ability to come back onto campus for their isolation and quarantine period. The new change uh, in CDC guidance has been quarantine. You may remember it used to be a 14 day period. We found that there are relatively few infections in those last few days. And so we're modifying our recommendations for students who are exposed that they test on day five because that's a frequent, a high rate of people will have converted by day five. And if you're positive, we want to isolate you as well as identify any contacts you may have inadvertently exposed and then test on day 10. If your day 10 test is negative, then you're good. We don't feel you need to stay in quarantine any longer. You should always, of course, keep on top of symptoms. You should mask and distance just like you would, um, you know, every one of us should be doing to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Next slide. And I wanna speak a little bit about sequestration. Sequestration is a little different. Remember, isolation is a student who has positive, they have virus, they're infected. Quarantine or individuals have been exposed. We use sequestration for situations where you've got an increased risk of being exposed. No definite exposure has occurred, but you've been involved in activities that increase your chance of picking up the virus. These include travel as well as any unmasked activity. So when you have this, we're recommending that for a period of 10 days, you practice if, uh, distancing and masking in the residential unit except for your bedroom and shower. As students who are living on campus, uh, the undergrads know they are already in phase one, so everyone is doing this as well. You are able to leave your residential space for classes, research, or meal pickup, but we want you to do some extra testing. If you've traveled off campus and been away overnight, uh, we want you to test on arrival when you return within 24 hours, as well as day five and day 10. 
Also, if you've been involved in unmasked activities, you joined some friends off campus, you went to a restaurant, folks were unmasked, you went to a home and folks were unmasked. We then think you should increase your testing, move in it, not just to weekly testing, we move to test on day five and day 10. Continue to monitor your symptoms at all times. And again, if your day 10 test is negative, then you're through a sequestration period. So I'll be available to answer some more questions later on in this evening's town hall. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sosha. That was such informative information um, that you just provided. And I hope people took note to the five and 10 day markers. With that, <clears throat> next up, I'd like to invite our Vice Chancellor, Allison Satterlin, back to give some updates on about staying safe during winter break. Allison? Thanks, Ebene, um, and thank you so much, Angela, for um, that excellent overview. Many of you have heard us speak to these particular strategies uh, all fall and some of the summer. We just want to continue to reinforce how to stay safe with our um, Swiss cheese model, which with multiple layers of uh, protection, create a block that's um, more likely to reduce and, and certainly limit the, the spread of COVID-19 in our community. So just as a, a friendly reminder, wear your mask, screen and test, practice physical distancing. We also want to strongly encourage exercise and uh, investing time in, in the care of your, of your health and well-being. And if you uh, do reside off campus, uh, for winter uh, break or we'll be continuing to re reside off campus, we ask that you also commit to doing the, these same um, strategies. And then also a, a, a gentle reminder as well that weekly testing compliance will go into effect in January of uh, 2021. We're spending the next three weeks really engaging in and making sure our students are fully informed of all of the weekly uh, testing um, expectations and knowing where all of the uh, weekly um, and daily uh, testing sites are and how they're uh, available to you at your convenience. Next slide, please. We also wanted to acknowledge that with the uh, stay at home order, uh, many parts of the country and certainly here in California, uh, recognizing that the majority of campus will be closed for winter break, we wanted to offer you some ways to stay engaged um, in a healthy way. And so we reached out to our partners in career services who wanted to reiterate that this might be a, a great opportunity in addition to tending to your health and well being. And, um, uh, uh, taking some time for rest, that you think about uh, working with the career services team to make an appointment on Handshake to connect with an associate director and make some plans to update your LinkedIn profile, update your resume or CV, um, uh, explore career opportunities, um, undergraduate research opportunities, were, which are also a part of Handshake and um, available to um, students to participate in uh, virtually and remotely. And they asked me to pose this question to you, again, as a, an invitation for a winter break activity. You know, can you answer the question, tell me about your background and what are three skills that you would bring to this role if we were to hire you um, as an intern or as an employee? So I, I wanted to offer that as a way to stay engaged and utilize your um, uh, winter break, knowing the circumstances of the pandemic have really limited um, other options. So thank you on behalf of the Career Services Center for making that uh, available to you. And Dr. Williams, I'll hand this back over to you. Thank you so much, Vice Chancellor. Next up on the docket is Dean Jim Antony of the Graduate Division. He will share with us brief updates on graduate student success in the upcoming winter quarter. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams. Um, so just a couple of quick updates for graduate students. I want to remind everybody that we post on a daily basis multiple updates on the Dean's blog, or the, uh, which can be found there at the Grad Life website. Um, make sure to, as you've heard many times here, to also check the Return to Learn website very regularly. Uh, the updates there are important. Uh, for those of you who are in dissertation or thesis mode, um, it's important to keep in mind that we've enabled a remote appointments uh, mechanism there to get advice, as well as remote defenses. That the, both of those mechanisms continue to uh, be in place and we're happy to offer those. Um, the Career Center is uh, on standby to assist our graduate students with any career advising and all of our professional development programming um, can be found on the gradvantage.ucsd uh, website. Next slide, please. 
A couple of quick reminders, uh, students who live in uh, HDH facilities, grad and family housing should, of course, as we've heard already from Dr. Sosha and others, follow guidance for on-campus students regarding COVID-19 daily symptom screening. We really want to make sure that graduate students and families living in on-campus housing uh, get great uh, participation in all of the testing. Remember, the testing is free for all students and all members of an on-campus household. We wanna again remind students to sign up for a direct deposit for both employment or payroll, as well as for stipend and financial aid. Unfortunately, it's two different uh, direct deposit systems, but we need students, graduate students to be signed up on both of those because uh, it'll really help facilitate payment, especially during these uh, COVID pandemic times where it's extraordinarily difficult to get you paper checks. Uh, graduate student employees, we want to remind you, as is true with all instructors, you can choose to work remotely. This has been working well this term, and we'll continue to monitor this uh, in quarters going forward. As far as research and the research ramp up, um, everything is pretty much uh, the same as we've talked about before. Uh, and the reminder is graduate students are not to be considered essential research employees. Uh, those of you who are working in research environments on behalf of PIs, we encourage you to continue having conversations with your PIs. Um, but right now we remain in the current uh, uh, research tier. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Anthony. I don't know about you, but when I was a student, I really wanted my financial resources. So I hope you take that advice so that you get the money that you need. Our last update tonight before we get to Q&A is from Himlata Havari. She's our Executive Director of Housing, Dining, and Hospitality. Himlata? Thank you, Ebene. Um, I know there was already uh, a couple of questions for winter quarter and housing, so I hope I uh, answered some of those uh, as we go through. Uh, so as Dr. Sosha shared the recent rise in positive cases in the San Diego County and really across the country, uh, keeping that in mind, we will remain at single occupancy for winter quarter. So every student will have their own bedroom in undergraduate housing and graduate housing. Graduate housing is always a uh, single occupancy. Uh, again, um, as you can see, uh, we make sure that all our decisions are led by uh, considerations and input from our health and safety experts, uh, making sure that our students, employees, and the local communities uh, are kept safe. Uh, we will be increasing asymptomatic testing uh, for students living on campus. As you know, currently it is uh, biweekly and we will be going to weekly testing. Uh, you also heard about the wastewater testing uh, and the number of tests have, in, uh, the detectors have increased to 52, which will be scaled to 200 by the time we open back up for winter quarter. Dining will continue to be offered in a to-go model. So students are currently using the Triton to-go app and we're seeing 70 to 90% uh, of students using that depending on their location. So we will continue with that. Indoor dining has remained closed for the fall quarter. And so indoor dining will continue to remain closed as we go into the winter quarter. All students who have applied for winter quarter housing uh, and are on the currently on the wait list, they will be offered a housing contract. We started to offer contracts Friday of last week and we'll, we'll be offering contracts all of this week. Uh, so if you applied for an on-campus housing contract, if you haven't received a contract yet, you will receive that this week. Uh, room assignment information, once a student does accept the contract, will be available in mid-December. Of course, the next logical question is, what about spring quarter? Uh, as you know, it's really important that we consult with our health experts. Uh, so we will continue to work with them as we start the winter quarter. And then we will have some guidance uh, probably around uh, mid to late February when the wait list will open for spring quarter. With that, I will turn it back to Ebony. Thank you so much, Hemlata. Um, such great updates and timely questions. With that, we get to, this is the end of our updating portion of this. And I'd like to thank all of our presenters for providing such pertinent information as we prepare for winter break and winter quarter. And we've heard how well you have done by keeping each other safe for fall quarter. Um, and, but you still have other questions. A lot of those questions are getting answered in the Q&A. But to moderate this piece, I'm excited to welcome 
that gave me so many titles. <laughs> Our Associated Student President, Kimberly Jing Chan, who's, <laughs> I can't do it, Kimberly. I was gonna say Madam Queen. Um, and also Quinn Nguyen, who's our Graduate Student Association President. If you're not aware of who these women are, they were elected by you, undergrad and graduate students, to lead on behalf of you and make sure your voice is heard among the group of leaders you saw today and other leaders that work on this campus to ensure that student-centeredness is a part of what we do, but the student voice is heard and upfront. With that, Kimberly and Quinn, I'd like to turn the floor over to you as I invite all of our panelists to turn on their cameras, please. Thank you so much, Ebene. Um, I'm gonna wait as people turn on their cameras. Um, so I think I will start us off with um, the questions. And my question is to Dean John Moore, um, specifically about winter quarter. I think a lot of students are interested in what's going to be happening, especially for classes. So can you give us a sense of what's planned for on-campus instruction? And if there's any specific criteria for allowing in-person classes at any point in time? Sure, thanks very much. And um, unfortunately, we the short answer is we don't really know. The longer answer though, is that we do have plans for in-person courses. We have about 10% of our courses being offered either hybrid or in-person for winter quarter. And um, that is currently the plan that we are working with. However, we do need to follow the state, county and local ordinances and restrictions um, based on where we are with the pandemic. And so what is going to be allowed may change. As you know, in the fall quarter, we had to pivot very quickly in the last few weeks from in -person, some in-person courses that were in, in, indoors to move them either outdoors or move them to remote. And depending on where we are in the pandemic in the beginning of winter quarter, there may be um, similar adjustments. And I understand that this is, this is of great interest to students who need to make plans for the winter quarter. And I absolutely wish we could give you more information now. There will be some communication coming out as the chancellor pointed out earlier in his remarks. And um, so I encourage you to watch your emails and pay attention to university communications because they will have very valuable information as, as things develop. Awesome, thank you, Dean Moore. I'll, I'll say as a student, just hearing that and knowing that things are going on behind the scenes and that, you know, conversations are being had um, is a lot more helpful than um, not knowing at all. So I appreciate that answer a lot. Um, this next question goes to Hamlada. Um, do you plan to allow more students to move on campus starting winter quarter? Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, we do have an interest from students uh, wanting to live on campus for winter quarter. Uh, we did open the wait list in November um, and uh, we've had about a little over a thousand students uh, that would like to stay on campus. Again, working with our health experts, uh, we feel comfortable uh, with um, adding additional density on campus as long as students are in single rooms. So we will be allowing uh, additional students on campus. Uh, and hence, as I shared earlier, um, any student that wants to live on campus, we have enough space so far um, that we will be able to offer every student on the wait list a housing contract for winter quarter. That's great to hear. Um, so as we then, you know, I think this question then will come up, come as no surprise to both you and um, possibly Angela also, we know that in the fall there was this big plan for how move-in was going to happen. So are we doing that again this winter or is it, how is it gonna look like for students? Hi, Quinn. Yeah, it's going to be a lot very similar to the fall for the new students, for the students who've never lived on campus, don't have a key um, to their new residence. They will go through a drive through process. It will be located over at Athena Circle. They'll drive through. They'll be able to have two family members who can accompany them. No more than two um, can go into the residential space to help them move in. It will be very much an appointment based. You'll have an assigned time to get your testing in to move in so that we keep the um, residential spaces de-densified with a lot, not a lot of folks in there. You'll have um, a half an hour to unload your things. Uh, then you can move around uh, with your family off campus. So a very similar process that we used for the students who are new to our campus. For the undergrads and graduate students who are returning to campus, so anybody who's coming back to campus after being away, 
right? Which we think most of our students are going to be able to take advantage of winter break at their homes. Very few are actually going to stay on campus the entire time. You will go through a period of a testing on arrival that will be self-administered testing. Easy, we'll have kits available. We hope to have vending machines located in a lot of locations around campus where you can pick up a uh, kit do your testing and have your results back in 24 hours. Um, we'll also ask you to test on day five and day 10. Um, that will be the same process for those new students as well. So you have a little more testing, uh, arrival day five and day 10, and then you move into weekly testing for the remainder of the winter quarter. That's our current plan. Of course, we'll adjust if we need to based on what's happening in San Diego. Hemlata, do you wanna add any more to that process? Um, the only thing I was going to add was dates um, is for our new students, uh, it will be January 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. If students arrive after those dates, they will need to go to the Price Center. Uh, again, students need to complete their test before they can get keys to their residential areas. For returning students, uh, we have, we're already asking students to sign up uh, for their arrival date. So we do know how many students are arriving which day. Uh, of course, returning students have a lot more options, so they could arrive a few days earlier, uh, arrive uh, a week late, uh, but what we are asking students to let us know so we know how many students uh, will be on campus on which days. Fantastic, and all of that testing is free. Um, this next question goes to Angela as well. How long does someone have to isolate themselves after a positive COVID-19 test? You, generally, it's going to be a period of time, no less than seven, um, 10 days, but it will depend on whether or not your symptoms. If your symptoms are improving, you've had no fever for three days, after the 10-day period, you'll be able to come out of isolation. But if you're still, if your symptoms are not improving or you're still febrile, having fevers, uh, then you need to stay in longer. So what happens is a student health team will be talking to the student who's in isolation, or uh, if you're not a student, it would be with a public health team or your clinical provider, and you have to meet a clinical criteria, time frame, and a clinical criteria to be released from isolation. That's awesome. Okay, so I think that's uh, a lot of information for students as they figure out what their plans are. Um, so we're going to pivot just a bit, and this question again goes to Dean John Moore. Um, so this is something that ever, all the students are talking about right now. So what can you share about pass, no pass as a grading option um, for this quarter specifically, fall quarter? Certainly. Um, and so many of you as students should have received a communication that went out th today from the registrar talking about a change in, in policy. The... Um, just let me back up a little bit. The reason that, that it's complicated changing the policy on grading options is that there's no single policy that we can flip a switch on. The policies are distributed in various different places. Um, the policy for when a student can request a grading option change from a letter grade to a pass, no pass, that's, this is a Senate policy. And this, because of the late um, time frame in the quarter, there wasn't time for the Senate to consider this um, in, in, a, in, a, in a unified way. So instead, what, what the Educational Policy Committee, which is a, um, uh, a committee of the Academic Senate, decided to do was to encourage students who want to change from letter grade to pass, no pass, to allow them to petition and to petition retroactively. And so that means that you can actually petition for a change in grading option after you've already seen what your letter grade is going to be. So this is actually a, a quite a huge thing because that normally doesn't happen. And that's actually a much more liberal policy than we find in our, in our sister campuses, UC campuses, who normally have, have changed this to the final day of instruction. So we're still working out the details of how we're going to implement this. The, we're hoping to do it in a way that students won't have to go through their departments or their colleges. They'll be able to submit the petition directly to the registrar and we'll be able to do that um, fairly quickly. There are a couple of caveats, however, that are very important. And one is that while you can change your grading option from a letter grade to a pass, no pass, some courses um, in order to count towards your major are required to have a letter grade. And this is again, the distributed nature of the policy 
the departments determine which courses might need a letter grade. Departments have the ability to waive that requirement, but this has to be done on a department by department basis. So you'll, you should check with your department before you request a pass, no pass grade. Um, if this is a course that you need to satisfy a major requirement or a general education requirement and, um, and see whether that those pass, no pass grades will be able to account for those requirements. The other piece of the policy that's not changing is the 25% cap on the number of pass, no pass courses that a student can take in their academic career. Um, so these courses will go towards that 25% cap. Um, so, so the good news is we're able to change the, um, we're able to petition to make these grading option changes retroactively. Uh, there'll be, you'll have, have to do it within the first four weeks of winter quarter. And um, please, again, keep um, looking at your email because the details of exactly how we're going to roll this out are still being developed. But this is, um, we're very happy to be able to support students in this way. You should have seen my reaction the moment we all got that email. I was jumping up and down. But um, I want to say thank you, first of all, to Dean Moore. I think it's evident that, you know, everyone involved has been a champion for students since day one. Um, and we've all just kind of been figuring out how to make it happen. Um, we saw back in spring quarter, um, Dean Moore, you kind of spearheaded that effort um, to make accommodations for students as well. So thank you, um, Allison, Maruth. Uh, Patty, Quinn, thank you everyone for making it happen for students. My inbox is now being flooded, um, but with good emails this time. So thank you. I've been taking the time to read about how much this policy change is, is doing for students. It's, it's doing a lot more um, for them than we even know. Um, so thank you to everyone that made that happen. And I hope students are able to take advantage of that change. Um, Thanks so all much. Right. I, I saw something in the chat that um, this is real. This is only for pass, no pass, which are undergraduate courses. This doesn't apply to SU courses for graduate students. Yes. All right. The next question then is for either John or Allison, whoever wants to take it. Um, so looking forward to fall 2021, do you expect hybrid and online course options to continue in order to maintain flexibility for students? We don't know, of course, what's going to happen in fall 2021. It's very possible that we'll be um, in something resembling a post-pandemic situation, in which case we could go back to the type of instruction that we had pre-pandemic, which would not have um, the same number of remote courses as we currently have. On the other hand, I think as a campus, we have learned that it's actually possible to do remote instruction. And this is something that we uh, probably didn't think we would be able to do. So there is going to be um, a work group that's going to start meeting next quarter that's going to be looking at how we can um, take some of the lessons from this remote environment and think about how we can use that moving forward to promote resiliency in our offerings, to um, use remote courses where they work well, to use more hybrid courses or flipped courses um, where um, aspects of the instruction is remote and other aspects are in person. So there's a lot for us to learn from this and um, we're, we're beginning to have those conversations. Yeah, I think um, Kimberly, what I, what I would add is that there are faculty who are really excited about this um, mode of instruction and are looking forward to continuing. And, and then for those of us that work to engage and support students outside of the classroom, We've also found the value of being able to make sure um, we can have remote and virtual student uh, services available. Podcasts, for example, and uh, case management services delivered uh, remotely and uh, telemedicine, you know, uh, uh, programs and um, activities that are, are hosted by university events that are remote as a complement to what happens um, on campus as well. So it's um, a silver lining that has come out of this um, really um, uh, difficult uh, situation. Thank you so much for, um, for that. It's good to hear that faculty and everyone's thinking about you know, how to really work with the situation. So um, now looking really far ahead, there's been quite a few questions as has been in the news about the vaccine. So I think Angela, you're the right person for this. You know, what is gonna happen when we get the vaccine? Are we making it available? How are students gonna get it? Everything about the vaccine. <laughs> 
Uh, well, we're obviously very excited. I think um, all the medical community is very um, pleasantly surprised by the effectiveness of the vaccine, as well as the manufacturer's ability probably to rapidly get large amounts of uh, vaccine out. Uh, where the vaccine will be distributed is going to be prioritized in a fairly rational way. We know that our health system, the acute care hospitals will get small amounts. Even in the hospital setting, they will be prioritizing the critical care doctors, the ED. Actually, it's the entire critical care team. It's the respiratory therapists, the nurses, the custodians. It's everybody working in the highest risk spaces. It's gonna take a while before the vaccine supply is deep enough um, and that will have easy access for healthy students. There may even be in the student community some triaging for students who have the underlying medical conditions. What we do know though, is we have a really effective way to vaccinate our students. We've used it for influenza. We're totally prepared. When we have access to the vaccine, we'll be able to get it to our students very quickly. So um, I don't think that the problem will be our ability once vaccine is in our hands to get it to our students. It will be when we are in the allocation of vaccine to receive vaccines that we can give to our students and the rest of our campus community as well. So we're going to be all in to uh, vaccinate as readily and as quickly as we can when we receive the allocations that are appropriate for our community. So um, just a follow up question on that, then will it be required for students who, who want to come to campus? I think there'll be a lot of discussion about this. There are some saying that, do you want to make this mandatory to protect others in these environments? And there, I think discussion will be had about both the work and the learning space, whether to be in close proximity and engage in the in-person components of either our job or our learning, we need to be vaccinated to take care of each other. No final decision. I think it will be a important and complex discussion. Hopefully people will wanna be vaccinated. <laughs> I'm hoping we'll have a great uptake. Well, I wanna be vaccinated, but someone's going to have to hold me down because needles I cannot deal with at all. I promise to hold your hand, Kim. I promise for both. And most of the vaccines look like what we're going to have are going to be two shots separated by time. No, Just my hand isn't enough. You you have to like anchor both me hands. down. I'll, I'll, hug, I'll hug you dearly. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. My next question is for Allison. The hot question. Why is the university activity fee charged at the same amount while student involvement activity fee or activities are currently limited? So I get this question every town hall and I appreciate it nonetheless because I know how important it is. Um, and I know also how frustrating it is to pay for um, services um, that you can't have immediate access to in the ways that you desire. Please know that all um, tuition fees are set at the UC office of the president and that is out of our um, authority. And please know that we have continued to work as um, diligently and creatively as we can to shift all of those in-person services uh, remotely or virtually. And we will continue to do that until we can uh, be in uh, person to, to provide you with those services that you desire on campus. Thank you very much, Allison. I know yesterday, um, Rich, who uh, is director of Recreation actually came and talked with the graduate students about all the programming available there. So um, recreation is definitely making sure that we still have a chance to stay healthy. Um, so pivoting again uh, quite a bit, this question will go to Dulce. Um, we know a lot of our international um, colleagues are actually not in the country right now. They're, they're staying at home. Um, so if they don't have a bank account, or you know, they don't have bank account info, um, how are you gonna be able to get financial aid or if your grad students get paid for um, research or anything like that? So let me start and then maybe I can also then um, uh, ask uh, Dean Anthony to also respond because I, I believe this is partly a question about how will graduate students be paid and, and things like that. So for international students, there is a need to provide a um, financial statement in order to be eligible for a visa to enter the United States. So um, they will accept either a paper document or they can even um, show something that, that's on their, uh, like say an online banking form. Uh, for ISPO, the International Students and Programs Office, we're not requesting updated uh, financial statements to issue immigration documents, again, to accommodate students that have these challenges. 
Um, and then I'll go ahead then and kick it over to uh, Dean Anthony to answer the payment of, of uh, salary or fees to, for students. Thanks, Dulce, I appreciate it. So, you know, the first challenge that we all faced when we knew we were gonna be going into uh, this pandemic uh, mode was whether or not we could even appoint um, graduate students who were living abroad? And if so, for how much time could we appoint them? The good news um, is that we worked with the UC uh, Office of the President, and uh, we have been given the dispensation to actually allow those appointments, number one, to occur in the first place, which is great, and number two, to go ahead and occur for this entire academic year. So that's a huge development. The second thing is we've already been working this quarter with students who are living abroad, who are appointed uh, in various types of appointments. So those same approaches that we've been using will continue to be used. Remember, it's different if you're working uh, as an employee of uh, uh, a teaching assistant employee, the way you get paid is through one kind of system. If you're getting some kind of disbursement through a fellowship or other kind of funding uh, that it's not for employment, that's a totally different kind of mechanism. On one, uh, we're able to cut paper checks uh, and be able to distribute those quickly uh, to wherever a person is. Um, that's the employment thing. There's nothing we can do about that because it's governed by a central system of the UC system. And then for the other, we're able to actually wire money. Um, so that's how everything's been working so far this quarter. We'll continue doing that throughout the year. Thank you. I am. This is Zoom life. Um, Wi-Fi just doesn't like me right now, but I'm, I hope you all can hear me. Um, this next question also goes to Jim. So with the new stay-at-home order in effect, um, how are graduate students going to do their research on campus and how does it affect grad students um, during their holiday travel? So there's two questions there. The first one's easy. At this time, there is no change or impact on student research. So everything that we've been doing, we're continuing to do. The second question has to do with, uh, you know, the stay at home order and its impact on travel. Remember what the governor's office has encouraged us all to do, all of us, is to when possible, cancel non-essential travel. If you find yourself having traveled, then you need to follow the campus policies that Dr. Sosha alluded to. It's as simple as that. Awesome, I'll take the next one as well then. Are there plans for CAPS to expand across the seven colleges as there is a high student demand for this resource? And this can either go to Allison or Maruth. Yes, there will be um, dedicated individuals for Seventh College, um, the whole CAPS team. And we'll also, thanks to the students and their support through the referendum, we will have a large number of new recruits to expand the CAPS services, both by the number of individuals as well as the depth of services that CAPS will be providing to students. We will continue to offer a lot of that remotely because that works for everybody quite well. Um, and so we hope to increase access and depth of CAPS services for students. Thank you so much. Um, all right, this next question goes to Sherry. Um, for any students who are off campus, um, and there's quite a few of them, how should they try to engage with their colleges and build community? Yeah, so I think it's important for students to remember that your college is here for you, whether you're living on campus with us, living on campus somewhere else, or off campus. Um, we're still offering uh, student organizations, events, activities, and each college does send out a weekly newsletter that has a list of upcoming things. Um, many of us are doing drop-in hours for advising and for student affairs staff as well, so if you do find that you're having a little trouble connecting, um, be sure to reach out to us, come to our drop-in hours. Uh, we're definitely here to help support you in whatever way you can, uh, no matter whether you're here on campus, here in San Diego, somewhere else in the US, or even around the world. Fantastic. I guess this next question is kind of um, along similar lines, but we're hearing from students that they're looking to build community. So what advice would you give to a student who wants to build a community? Um, either Patty or Maruth, go ahead and take that. All right, um, I'll start uh, and then uh, Maru can fill in as well. Um, yeah, I think, the, I think the key here is if you don't show up, it's really hard to get engaged in any kind of community. And so 
my best advice is uh, is to is to get engaged with what's happening online. And I know that this remote world is wearing thin on all of our nerves. Uh, but if you show up, I think you'll find that uh, you'll be able to get connected to other students and other uh, folks across campus. Um, last quarter, uh, this past quarter, we've had over 500 events that our student organizations have coordinated. Um, in the winter quarter, we'll be doing a whole lot of welcoming events again, our Triton Week of Welcome. So that'll include uh, a student organization fair, student services festival and academic support fair. We're, we're ramping up our e-games. There's all sorts of events and activities that are happening. And we just, uh, we just need you to show up and be engaged. And you'll find community and connection in those ways. Um, and I know it's hard, but you just got to put yourself out there. And Maruth, you want to um, add in anything? Yeah, I think I just would echo what um, Patty has said. Um, and also um, continue to connect with um, your peer leaders, um, peer mentors, peer educators. They're a great resource a great way to connect. And if you haven't connected or if you uh, want to continue to stay connected, um, join SRS this week as we take on finals with our study jams. Um, visit us, any of the SRS units on, uh, on Instagram um, and you can get information on our SRS site regarding our study jams and that's srs.ucsd.edu. All right, thank you so much to all our panelists. Um, fortunately, we've run out of time. So I'm gonna have to send this back to you, Ebony. Well, thank you to our Madam President's Collective hosting our Q&A. Uh, it was a great time. We are sad that our time has come to the end, but we're very excited about all the questions we were able to answer and all the questions you, you sent. And thank you for being here. Now, um, if you go to our returntolearn.ucsd.edu website, that'll include the recording as well as answers to your pre-recorded and questions that we weren't able to get to, as well as some of the ones we were able to get to that we think will benefit the larger student body. I'd like to thank our presenters and my colleagues for sharing their time, talent, and care as well as information with us today. Um, I thank our guests, our, our students, uh, for being with us tonight and sticking with us and Triton's keeping Triton safe, right? Um, I'd like to thank UCSD students for attending. Tomorrow, UC San Diego Executive Vice Chancellor Elizabeth Simmons will be hosting a town hall for faculty. So we are doing this for all contingencies of UC San Diego to make sure they're aware of what's going on. This Thursday is Triton Madness. I think all of you may know that we have a, we're division one. So this is a way for us to kick that time off. So if you need a break for studying, want to win some swag and compete with each other, it's a great way to build community. Hopefully they'll sit the reg registration link in the chat. If you're more introverted and want some time to yourself, you can check out our Triton Tools and Tidbits podcast. And with that, um, I'd like you to, um, we'll continue town halls. So if you'd like to know about them, please check our Return to Learn website for more information. And uh, thank you for being with us tonight. It's been absolutely my pleasure to host uh, along with all of my colleagues. Have a great winter break, a great start of winter quarter. Get some rest, take care of yourself. Good luck on finals. Take care. Bye.